This guy says we're pivot. You understand just how we live it. This for me is like rap religion. Open on B, cause we got this Skype. When it come to this, y'all, I can get it hype. When it come to this, y'all, calm has risen. How you living, huh? Yo, how you living, pivot? <laughs> I'm gonna uh, be very selfish and turn this conversation around to myself. Yes, you should. Are you ready? Yeah, you ready. Okay, enough about. That's right. I'm gonna be very, holo- uh, very Hollywood. Enough about me. More about me. She uh, ready? Go ahead. What about you? I was talking to uh, a comic that I can't name, mm-hmm. um, and she told me that I'll never know what it's like to be a stand-up comic because. I haven't gone through the rites of passage. I haven't slept around the country for no room, you know, you, you know, done the open mics and logged the hours of a stand-up comic. And so I'll never know what it's like. And then I said, well, th- I, I thanked her for her honesty. And I let her know that there isn't a night when I'm not on stage somewhere. And yes, I'm, I'm very lucky to have an audience um, that I've earned through my acting. Um, and then when I'm not up there, I might be at the dime performing for two people. You know what I mean? Uh, for a couple millennials, they have no idea who I am and it's heavy lifting. And I've also been on stage since I was eight years old and didn't break through till I was 37. So I understand the grind. You know what I mean? So that's what I was trying to say to you. It's like, it, it's a community that, you know, holds onto their space very tightly. I personally feel like she was out of order for saying that because she don't know you. She don't know what the fuck you've been through. Yeah. That's I hate when people try to say, oh, you haven't done what I've done, so that you don't, you won't know. Right. But you don't know where I come from. Right. So you can't say, I don't know. Right. I don't, I don't know what it's like to be you. I and I don't even want to know what it's like to be you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> to be honest, I don't give a fuck. Okay. Cause I'm already having a hard enough time dealing with what it's like to be me. Right. Right, so, yeah. but I'm happy to be in your presence. I would like to get to know you. I would love to get to enjoy you. I would love to watch you on stage and share you with all the audience and myself. Yeah. Right. So if you can do that, right. Fucking awesome, you're a comedian. Yeah. If you're scared to do that, you're not no comedian. Well, that's you know. You are comfortable in your own skin, you're not insecure. Yeah, and this that- is a for rent, this is for rent. Yeah. This is this is a meat suit, this is yeah. temporary. Right. I'm renting this, now, hopefully I get 100 years out of it. Yeah. Really, I only wanna get like 71, cause I'm gonna start doing drugs at 70. Uh, but like, okay. like, I'm just renting this. Right. And then I give it back, I give it back to the dust. But that, and that is the attitude you have to have on stage, otherwise you're gonna get killed, right? Yeah, you can't, and you literally, you're standing, like if you really sit back and think about it, when you're on stage, you're standing in front front of a room full of people, you can literally be thinking to yourself, if you allow yourself to go there, which I I have allowed myself to go there sometimes, there's a room full of judges, everybody in here is judging me. Everybody in here is going to dictate my future. Mm -hmm. You can let that happen to yourself, and then that will fuck you up. Okay. You will will slide into a depression. Mm -hmm. Because if they didn't laugh hard enough, if they didn't make eye contact with you, if they started talking while you were on stage, you could literally fall into a fucking dark asshole. That's exactly the question. You just answered the question that I asked you, which is what's the worst thing that can come into your psyche that will get in your own way of, your, of, 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 of creating, of working on your highest level, your highest vibration, and that's it, right? Yeah, but no. <laughs> so somebody coming up there trying to fuck with you is the worst thing. I think, it depends, it's for each comic is different. For me, it's somebody trying to attack me will fuck with my shit. Like I can't, I've decided, like, you know, my body, I'm in control of all this, right? This is my, this is my rental car, right? And uh, I'm the driver. My mind is the driver. My mind is the government of this country. Like, mm-hmm. if my body's a country, a, a union, my mind is the government. As long as I keep control of my mind 
and don't worry about what anybody else think, right. then I'll be fine. I came here to do a job. I came here to be a service. Either you receive my service or you don't. Right. It's not my fault if you don't. Which is an incredibly self-empowered, strong way to be. And It took a long time to get there, though. Either they like you or they don't. Right. You know? And at the end of the day, well, I'm almost 40. And what I've learned uh, over all these years is everybody cares about their motherfucking self. <laughs> like, every single person is here for they self. They like, yeah. they're here to learn their lesson, their thing, whatever. And they will go on your journey. They will, they will listen to you. They will follow you if you could tickle their soul, if you make them feel something. Right. So if you can make somebody feel something in the first 30 seconds of you, whether it's fear, joy, anger, whatever it is, any emotion you can make somebody feel in the first 30 seconds of meeting them, fear, like fear is really good. And that's a good one. It works very well. They will follow you, which is crazy. Uh, or excitement, whatever. Okay. They'll follow you. They'll follow you. Emotion is everything. You're an actor. It's going to be... Whoever said that to you about, like, you didn't pay your dues or whatever, that bitch was jealous. But I, she knows... What she does know is that you, you know how to work emotions. You're an actor. You know how to work emotions. You know how to make people feel. So if you use that skill, if you really utilize your acting skill, you'll out-dominate her because she doesn't have that skill. You feel me? If you know how to, baby, if you, can, if you know how to make somebody, if you can make somebody cry, and then make them laugh ten seconds later, God, you fucking beast. If you know how to make somebody angry, get them in their head like, what the fuck? Yeah, they fucking us, and they'd be like, yeah, <laughs> and start to laugh. That's power. That's called mobbing. You just mob these motherfuckers. <laughs> you feel me? Yeah. Like you just created a fucking mob. Right. Yeah, where you can make them come outside the comedy club and go with you to a party. Right. That's power. Yeah. Absolutely. And I and, made people leave a theater and we all went to a club. Yeah. That's power. I I think to be honest with you, we need that now more than ever. I know that's what I be doing. Well, God bless you. We need more of that. We, I'm a you know, we do. I'm a we do. And that's, you know, because you can try to do it in an article or in different arenas, but it can appear to be didactic. And when you do it. What it, is that word? Didactic. It means like overbearing too much, coming down. But uh -huh. when you do it with comedy, when you're making them laugh and you get that message across, because. The comedy is going to reveal a universal truth and, and, and crystallize these ideas that they, you know, maybe haven't thought about, but oh my God, you're right. We're with you. And then you add the intention, which is what you're talking about, and your emotions, and then you get them, you galvanize these people. It's, it's, that's something very powerful. Well, here's the thing though. Like your best teachers, every single teacher that you've ever remembered in your entire life has made you laugh. Straight up, they've they've tickled your soul. Mm -hmm. Every your best teachers have tickled your soul or made you feel something. Yeah, that's all the people like you're a grown ass man. But I bet you could call out at least three or four teachers in your life right now that made you feel something. Absolutely. And those people, and then you learn from them, right? Yes, so as a comedian, you are a lightweight a teacher. Like I think, like it's a platform, right? If I could teach you something in that platform. And if I can make you laugh, you'll never forget it, right? Yeah. So if I could teach you a, my, a, a philosophy of mine or something that I learned that I feel like really invoked something in me or whatever, I'm a teacher, I'm here to teach. I'm here, like, I know my purpose on this planet. What's the best way of me going about it? I'm not about to go to college and do two years and get a BA and then take a test and then whatever, and then I can go and these kids can talk shit about me. I'd rather just get on a big ass platform I did 10 years in these streets, really 20 years in these streets doing stand-up and struggling, whatever, grinding, and and I started making money and, and whatever. I'm more powerful than a regular school teacher. And my platform, I could change somebody's whole soul, their whole mind frame on something. I'm more powerful than a teacher, yeah. and I'm a teacher. Right. 
when you, and you understand that responsibility. Yeah, sometimes I don't give a fuck though. Right. Because but, sometimes they don't give a fuck. Well, but, but that's the duality of life and I get that and it's beautiful. But do you feel the pressure sometimes to, to try to convey thoughts and ideas that will transform people or, you know what I mean? Cause y y no. No. Sometimes I need to take an emotional shit. <laughs> Sometimes you're going to get a bag of bullshit. Okay. Sometimes you're going to get a bag, like a regular teacher. Right. Don't go anywhere. How You Live in J-Pivot will be right back after we pay some bills. All right, look, I'm going to be honest with you. I, um, I have something terminal. I have uh, male pattern baldness. I inherited it from my father. Um, it's been documented, you know, I've been making movies since I was 18 years old. It's not pretty what's going on with me. Um, I would literally take Alec Baldwin's back hair and staple it to my forehead if he would let me, but there's a better alternative. It's called keeps. Okay. It's easy for affordable. I love it. Listen, prevention is key. Treatments can take four to six months to see results. So act fast. Four to six months to get your hair back? Count me in. More than 50 million men in the U.S. suffer from male pattern baldness, and my God, I'm one of them. There are only two FDA-approved medications that can prevent hair loss. Keeps offers both. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Piven to receive your first month of treatments for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Piven to get your first month free. K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Piven. What are you guys waiting for? Let's get back in the game, you bald fuck. <laughs> Lucy Nicotine is a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. Listen, it, it's a real problem. Uh, nicotine is harder to to quit than, than heroin. So these guys, these scientists have figured out a way to do it. So let's get, let's get on board guys. It's 2021. All right. Get rid of your cigarettes, unplug your vape and get some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. What are you waiting for? This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each month. So it's simple and you don't have to leave your house because Lucy has delivery down. Go to lucy.co and use promo code PIVIN to get 20% off all products on your first order, including gum or lozenges. That's lucy.co and use promo code PIVIN at checkout. Also, I have to give this disclaimer. This product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Lucy.co and be sure to use that promo code PIVIN. This is what's so crazy to me about, about comedy. Um, w w what is amazing about it is you cannot, you can watch someone and not agree with their ideology. No. And still have a great time. Yes. Because you know where they're coming from. Because especially if they're being honest. Right. It's like, well, I don't agree with shit they got to say, but I understand it. And that was fun. Right. Because it was it, like kind of an argument without you having to say anything. I've watched comics on stage and I'm like literally arguing with them in my head and laughing at everything that they're saying. Right. Because I it, know they're wrong. Right. But they believe what they're saying. And I, I love it. There's something magical about that. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it's just like with a little kid. Like if you think of like, this is what I learned from Richard Pryor. Like he said, people don't come to comedy shows, they hear about your problems with it, they kind of have fun. And when you're on stage, think of yourself as a kid playing in a, playing imaginary by yourself, right? When you're doing that by yourself, what are you thinking about? Nothing. Do you care if anybody watching you? No. What are you doing? Building my story. You're having fun, building your whole little thing, your whole, just, just enjoy your whole thing. People gonna have fun watching you making your whole world like this, my kitchen, this, my this. You're right. making your own, like, 
People love watching kids play imaginary. Absolutely, and yet, Richard brought his problems on stage and exposed them to the world and was brilliant at it and, and somehow exposed his pain beautifully and perfectly. Because he played it on stage. He played it, though. He played with it. It wasn't like he was uh, in a psychiatric appointment. Like, right. So I did right. this, I did that. No, right. he was like living it right but it was still conveying his pain his and he pain was having in his in fun exposing himself right right like can't nobody expose you the way you can can't nobody like literally you can't say shit about me i ain't said about myself already right so you disarm them by being completely transparent and honest with yourself so it's self fun. selfishly I want you to, if you can, uh, I, I'm an actor who hasn't done stand-up, and what would you say to me? What's, what, what's the best way to embrace this journey as a stand-up comedian? The I would say write down, write every day, 10 minutes every day, 10 things that are true to you that you find amusing. If you can do 10 minutes every day of writing, about things like with your hand, not in your voice memo or yeah, anything. Yeah. Like literally with your hand. Right. In a notebook. Mm -hmm. Write down 10 things that would make you smile. If you saw it, if you heard it, mm -hmm. if you felt it, if you smelt it, if you dealt it, <laughs> like whatever it is, right? Yeah. 10 things every day. And then every time you got on stage, you talked about at least five of those things and make you great. Do you believe that it's more important to be interesting than to be funny? Yep. Well, in your <laughs> interesting shit is always funny, <laughs> right? Yeah. Even in a drama. Fucking, I watch Game of Thrones and I laugh all the time. Right. It's not a comedy. Because you're laughing at Pete Dinklage. First off, I want to no, fuck him. What, you no, wanna, don't even play you that. You want to fuck Pete Dinklage. I, wanna, I would like him to be my side man. Interesting. That could be my boyfriend. Don't play with me. Okay. That's a sexy man. Okay, I'm going to get off the Game of Thrones for a second because I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a little bitter. Why? Um, you auditioned for it? You didn't get it part? No. Um, I want me to be on I want me to break it down for you? Okay. Was you gonna be from Littlefinger? You would have made a good Littlefinger. I don't even know who Littlefinger is. I don't know who you Big don't Finger is. You don't even watch it? I don't watch it and I'll tell you why. If you would have been Littlefinger though, you would have killed that shit. I don't know who Big Finger is, Littlefinger. I don't even <laughs> fuck any of those people. I don't so, want to smell his finger, but I'll tell you this much. When we were closing down Entourage, I said to HBO, we need to publicize this shit. We've been on for eight seasons. And they said, now we're just gonna go out quietly. And I was like, what? And she pointed to a throne. I, this is a true story. And she said, we have the rights to the book of Game of Thrones. And that's our new project. We're all in. And she pointed to that big ass throne. And so my reference with Game of Thrones is, our shit is ending. We, we don't have any love for you. Your shit is done and played out. And now it's time for, you know, a bunch of people that we don't really have any emotional investment in killing each other every week. So I don't give a fuck. No, so I have but a- But y'all wasn't killing on there if y'all would have been killing people. Damn, that'd have been real LA shit. Uh, so I, I'm a little bitter and I need to get over it, but uh, you know. Yeah, but you're doing okay. I think well, you're doing fine. I'm doing, I'm doing all right. Can, can, doing speaking fine. of this, we would have done this interview at my house and you were saying like, this was your I bet you have a mad. big ass fucking house. Mm -mm. I bet you have a dope house. Well, that's because you're a cheap house Jew. Is, you're a cheap ass off, Jew. First off, you should you're not going to insult my people like you, this. You should have a huge house. Do, do you, my house is huge cons considering for my, for my people. I don't even know what that means. I got, you I you are a very prolific artist. I got 2,600 square feet at that, that house. And okay. then I got another house that's 5,000, but I can't live there yet. Okay, so. Because I'm gonna turn that into a group home. Oh, nice. Because too many people been talking about I'm moving in the neighborhood, so I gotta fuck them up. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna steer this back over to comedy really quickly. Yeah, you better, because I'm about to get real hood on your ass. I love it, I love it. Um, 
Is it true that you that you had been workshopping uh, your your stand up at Long in the Long Beach Laugh Factory? Yes. Okay. Um, what have they been saying about me in these streets? No, no, no. I've just been talking to Jay, who loves you, and Jamie. I love Jay. They're the best. The best. You know, Jay used to be mean to me when I first met him, and then I I think I yelled at him once, and then he was nice to me ever since. Sometimes you just gotta. I'm pretty sure you, I yelled at him. I was like, "Who the fuck you think I am, bro?" And then he was nice ever since. There you go, because people will take advantage of you until you let them know that you respect yourself, and I like it. So here's my question: um, How did? Because that became a playground for you, right? The Laugh Factory yes. is my house. I'm Ro the queen. I love it, and Long Beach became a place where you could just work it out. That's my house too. Okay. That's my summer home. All right. How did the summer home... Call me Khaleesi. How did the summer home... How did it... Uh, how did it change the game for you? Because they just kind of gave you full reign to do whatever you want there and, and, and work it out. Uh, okay, so are you talking about when the Laugh, Long Beach Laugh Factory first came about or no, I, I, just recently? Ba basically recently to work out your, your the one hour special, right? Yeah, I could have did that in Hollywood if I wanted to. Okay. Of course you could have, but <laughs> I, I, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The, it does, like, the location doesn't matter. It doesn't. I, just, I just meant, you know, when you're working an hour special, wh what is it that you need? that will open it up for you to really mine what you need to get after. I think you. Bless you. Excuse me. Two for, two for good luck. Two for good luck. One more, maybe. Three for better luck. If you look at the light, you'll stop sneezing. Mm -mm. It's look true. Look at the top of your mouth. So, no, I didn't lick it fast enough. <laughs> Bless you. Don't go anywhere. How You Live in J. Piven will be right back after we pay some bills. Support for How You Live in J. Piven is brought to you by Manscaped, who's the best in below the waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineering tools for your family jewels. You heard that right. I feel confident shaving with my boys. You know what I'm saying? Just a little trim and everybody wins. You gotta protect these family jewels. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trusted Manscaped, I'm one of them, with this exclusive offer to you, 20% off free worldwide shipping with the code PIVEN at manscaped.com. Now here's the deal, I'm a hairy Jew, okay? And this thing trimmed me up. I went from Jason Alexander to Jason Statham. In one shoop, everybody wins. I kid you not, I am addicted to this stuff. So solve this problem. I, I'm single, I'm 200 years old. I wanna have a family. So this is a part of my daily ritual. Get 20% off with free shipping with the code PIVEN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use Piven, the code Piven. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. The thing about being able to workshop uh, a one hour yeah. uh, is you just wanna have an audience, right? And it's, I remember when I did my first one hour special, it was a little difficult. Girls Trip hadn't came out yet. I finished it. I finished shooting Girls Trip, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna shoot my first one hour special. I hadn't even done a half hour yet. Just go straight to the one hour. And, cause I had done every single stand-up comedy show you could think of. That was seven, 10, 15 minutes, but never the full hour mm -hmm. or half hour. So I went straight to that with Showtime and it's about, Having an audience that is attentive, that like that that is willing to be a part of the process. So I don't know what it would have been like without social media, to be honest. 
uh, maybe in the 90s, if I was trying to do this, I would take out an ad in a newspaper or right. like fucking tell like a blabbermouth or two or hire a public publicist to blab it around town to get people to come out or hire a promoter to get people to come. But on my first one hour special, uh, I asked the Laugh Factory, hey, do you think you can give me an hour here, an hour there? And it was easy because at that time they had the San Manuel Casino, so I could drive out to there and they would do a, I would do an hour there. And then an hour at the Laugh Factory on a Wednesday, you know, and people came, but they didn't know they were coming to see me. They didn't know what they were coming for. You know, mm-hmm. and in Long Beach, I had a, I had a already a running situation there, so they would just allow me to stretch. Yeah. You know, so it was good. When you know you're trying new material for the first time, and it's that that's that great unknown, right? Uh-huh. What's the difference between, in your experience, when you felt like I'm just gonna I'm just gonna fully commit to this bit? It's never been seen before. You know that feeling. Is there a difference between when you're not fully there and you're fully, because it's, it's, you know, there's a little bit of fear in there when that's, you know, material for the first time. No, and the first time material, there's no fear in that. That's just like, let me see what happens. Let me throw this shit on the wall and see if it sticks. Like make a spaghetti. You know, that's how I had, like I'm cooking. I'm I'm in the kitchen cooking, so. Uh, and on stage, there's there's never any. Only time I'm afraid on stage is is if I'm talking about sexuality, uh, like if I'm talking about he that turned to she or she that turned to he or he, is that it them that that thing is really confusing to me right now. So there's fear in that things that I don't why, understand. Why, why is that fear in that? Because there's th- things that I don't understand is the only thing I have fear in because I don't understand it because I'm a human, right? So things I don't understand is things that I fear. If it's new material, I'm not afraid to present that because it's fucking, I understand it for the most part. It's new for me saying it in front of a room full of people, but I probably already said it in five conversations. So there you go. I probably already so, said it in my voice memo. Okay, so before, probably, before. But even if I, like the other night, I did a set and I, it ended up making it to my special. Uh, I just said, I said, uh, you know, my mom was so mean to me. I don't know why she was so fucking mean to me. And there's like all these other things that I say about her being mean to me, but it just came up in my spirit. I just saw my mom and I was like, yeah, she's mean to me because she know I'm the better version of her. I wasn't scared to say that. It's the truth. It's how I felt when I saw her and she looked at me. She know I'm the better version of her. It's like, she pick and save and I'm big lots. Mm-hmm. I'm the better version of my mama. Which is probably not the nicest thing to say, which is probably something you sh- would be mean to say. It's probably something that I should have been afraid to say or like feel like, oh, if my mom sees this, is she gonna be mad? Right. But I don't care. She didn't raise me. But but that's the beautiful thing about stand up is you can say these things are that are perceived to be taboo. But yeah, but I also believe she don't she loved me because I came out of her. Right. She don't like me though. Because but I'm it's a our, better version of her. But it's but it's she our She might be jealous. It's our job to eclipse our parents. Yeah, you're supposed to be better than them. But that don't mean they like that shit. Because their egos might be... I know if I become a parent, I'm going to be like, yes, be the best. Be better than me. I want to see somebody. but I want to see that. Even in my friends, I want my friends to be better than me. See, but that's one of the many reasons why you're so successful, by the way. Because you understand intrinsically that another person's success won't take away from your own. And that's part of your vibration. But it makes me feel good to see people that's, successful. That's, but that's the healthiest way to be in this life. But everybody ain't like that. No. And that's that, what's funny about it. Because the person that you walked out of, like literally I slithered out of her, she probably would like to see me be mediocre. I'm sure. But now but, she's claiming it. Now she's like, it's so funny because we went on a walk the other day and she's like, yeah, just call me Leola Haddish. I said, what? 
Her name been Leola English but since I can remember. She called herself Leola English. Leola, she, she claimed, I said, you claiming my daddy? She said, no, I'm not claiming your daddy. Never would I claim him. I'm claiming you. Then I was like, what do you want? <laughs> what, do you want? what do you want to she's like I need two CDs I want a CD account so if you if you had, shit, so I knew it though I knew she but, it, but isn't, it, isn't it great to have this arena where you can work all this out you know what I mean yeah because I'm very to, we're very lucky let's be honest the same time that I started going to comedy camp at 15 it's also the same time I started to go to therapy and I talked more on stage than I did in the therapist's office. And then I stopped doing stand-up for a little bit. Ended up becoming, I had a breakdown. Went back to therapy. The therapist is like, what makes you happy? And I said, just hearing laughter and seeing people smile makes me feel good. She said, well, get back into your stand-up. Right? So I get back into the stand-up. And here I am. I'm talking about these things on stage and I'm literally sitting with, I basically was using my therapist. I was paying this bitch $125 an hour Yeah. to do stand up for her. Right. Cause I was pouring my heart out, all mm -hmm. the things that bother me. And she's laughing and taking notes. Nah. You know what's hilarious is I was like, can I get those notes? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I started doing them on stage. That's amazing. I started doing well, her notes on stage. Well, they, they say that stand up should be like auditioning for a therapist. That's what it should be. Um, Who said that? But that's good. But uh, Adam Hunter told me that actually. But Adam Adam Hunter's the king of the one liners. Yeah, I know it doesn't match up, but that's <laughs> it, that's his philosophy. But you know what? It makes sense because he's hurt. Well, he's always he. You know, I love Adam. He's, you know, what I love about certain comedians? They will take care of you. They are some of the most caring. And every, I don't care what profession you're in. Actors won't do it. When I worked at the airlines, they wouldn't do it. When I worked at a youth center, they wouldn't do it. But comedians will always give you a hug, <laughs> even if they don't fucking like you. <laughs> they can hate your guts. Right. They will still give you a hug so and say, "Good set, man." Because they know how hard it is to be up there by yourself. So they his, know how vulnerable you are. So his philosophy was stand up is auditioning for therapists. What 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 do you what do you think stand up is? Stand up is teaching a lesson to a classroom of strangers. Of grown up grown up people grown up strangers. Ah, stand up. To me, stand-up is so many things. Stand-up is, uh, it could be a masturbation session. <laughs> it could be like a, uh, for me, mm -hmm. it could be a lesson, like me just teaching. Stand-up could be a party. It could be an audition. Where would you be without stand-up? Oh no, that's my husband. Stand up is my boyfriend, my husband, my everything. Like I don't, know. I don't know if I would. I don't. Even, I don't even know if I could function without him. I don't like even thinking about like if somebody if we if Jamie banned me from the club, Jamie Masada banned me from the Laugh Factory for like a month. And I could perform in all these other places, but being told I couldn't be in my house, like, and I didn't want to be no, like, and I could perform anywhere else. But that's like, it hurt. Hmm. That shit hurts. Uh, I don't know where, I don't know. If I was a school teacher, I'd be the comedic school teacher. If I was, if I worked at the DMV, I'd be telling jokes. Mm -hmm. I'd figure out a way to do it funny. Yeah. So you would you would always find a way to convey 
You when are. I was working at the airlines, I was like, in my boarding announcements, I would <laughs> yeah. figure out how to tell yeah. a joke in it. Like, yeah, you would find a stage no matter what. I could, I could not function with it. If it was like, you have to go two months, no jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you couldn't do a joke detox. I couldn't function. I can't. I can't even comprehend that right now. Mm. It hurts my feelings. Yeah. I don't think people understand that. That hurts my feelings. Yeah. Like, don't want to. I don't want you to say anything that's gonna make anybody smile or laugh for the next two to three months. I would probably want to die. Hmm. I would probably, <laughs> I would probably die. Hmm. Like, well, I would probably turn into a full blown bitch. Well, thank God <laughs> that you don't have to. I'm trying to run, like, so. I'm swallowing my tears. <laughs> so the good news is. I can't even look you in your eyeballs because you're really good at see. You just you a little soothsayer, ain't you? Ah. <laughs> this you're was super, fun. You super that, good at seeing people emotions. Look at you. Yeah. Well. Look you, at you. you. Look at you. Go be a therapist in your next show. Yeah. Is this I, a documentary about therapy for comedians? Uh, yeah. I mean, listen. I, I'm very lucky in the way that. I'm taking this journey and um, you now know. I want to eat something from Agos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want that was a non sequitur. I love it. I want some Lego Stevens. Let's do it. How You Live in J. Piven is a cast original podcast in association with Common Enemy and Tenderfoot TV. Producer is Kyle Tequila. Theme song by Common. Executive producer for cast is John Svack. Executive producers for Tenderfoot TV are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Executive producers for Common Enemy are Jared Einson and Dave Osako. Catch all new episodes of How You Live in J. Piven every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts.